All right. Well, welcome everybody to the Uncovering Anomalies podcast. I am your host, Adam. And again, this week, um, I'm doing this solo, unfortunately. Topher is on vacation. So I'll be your host alone um, this episode on episode 46. Yes, we're at 46. A lot going on this week. I do want to start with some, I guess, comedy, or I think it's funny. Uh, I don't know if you guys know, there is this candidate. His name is Dr. Shiva. I think he's running on the Republican uh, ticket or side. Not really sure because he's not totally Republican in the in the traditional sense, or I guess in the modern sense. Uh but he has a great sense of humor, and I think it's mostly because he's serious. You know, those comedians that say really funny stuff, but are just they never even crack a smile. Those are the ones that really crack me up for some reason. Um, so I feel like he's like that. I'm not saying he's a comedian, but he just says really funny things that I don't know <laughs> that would crack me up if I was in front of him. But he doesn't even crack a smile. So he had this really viral clip that went on, and he's talking about the other Republican candidates, or even, uh, no, all candidates in general. So I want to start out with this, uh, just because it's just a must-see. People have to see this. Uh, all right, let's cue this up. Let's press play. Every presidential candidate, except me, sucks Zionist hawk. That may not sound presidential, but in fact, it's very presidential. Because I <laughs> represent the American worker who does not want us to be cocksuckers of Zionism. Donald Trump sucks Zionist hawk. Nikki Haley sucks Zionist hawk. Vivek the snake sucks Zionist hawk. Chris Christie, Booby fucking Kennedy, Joe Biden, all of these people. The only people that don't suck Zionist hawk are the American workers who are being screwed. I'm an American worker. I'm one of us. But Donald Trump is no different than any one of them. They all serve Israel. Bernie Sanders, for example, is an Israeli citizen. Anthony Blinken is an Israeli citizen. The head of the CDC is an Israeli citizen. All of these people are Israeli citizens. All of these people work together against the American working people. There's a lot of liberal Zionists who are out there saying ceasefire, peace now. I've seen that for 40 years. It doesn't get us anywhere. All that ceasefire does is let Israel pull back, then go bomb the shit out of the Palestinians again. The only way to end this is we must end the occupation. Ending the occupation means beginning with ending the occupation of America by Zionism. Zionists have taken over every seat of power of the United States. If we're going to free Palestine, we must that. end the occupation of America by Zionism. If there's anyone who should get military aid, it should be the Palestinian people. I'm not talking about Hamas, by the way, all those morons who think Hamas represents the Palestinian people. Hamas was created by Israel. When you yep. see Hamas, replace it with Israel. We need to build a bottoms up movement. Go to <laughs> so many truths in that. You really can't argue with a lot of what he said. Uh, funny, not funny. Also very serious. All right, so returning to our uh, topic at hand. So this is pretty crazy. So uh, we've talking about the MH370 videos. Again, looking like it's real, right? But we're not making any definitive decision here if it's real or not. But it's looking like it's real. Um, even Kim.com, he has now weighed in uh, on X. And he says... This is potentially the most significant leak of military technology in history. There is video evidence from 2014 that the U.S. military is in possession, possession of technology that most would describe as alien. Objects that fly with some sort of gravity propulsion with unbelievable speed and maneuverability shielded by a vacuum layer that can potentially penetrate anything. These advanced objects seem to be able to create portals that can make a Boeing 777 airliner disappear in an instant. This evidence has been out there for a decade, but it looks like, and he's tagging here Ashton Forbes, and his investigation to attract wider attention. Now, many people here listening or not, or, you know, this issue is dividing up the UFO community, which sucks. There's always something that divides some community, huh? So when you look at it in that sense, it could be some kind of op, you know, I don't, again, I don't, I'm not making any definitive uh, things there. It's just, you know, when you, when you, when something comes in and divides people, you know, 
uh, we should be careful of it. But anyway, so he goes, the leaked videos, when combined, create a problem for debunkers. Oh, wait, he goes, the evidence is compelling because it was filmed from three different surveillance platforms simultaneously, two U.S. spy satellites and one U.S. military drone. He's right there. And that's one of the strengths of these uh, of these videos. The leaked videos, when combined, create a problem for debunkers because the physics match up from different angles. It would take a gigantic effort to fake something like this. Correct. You know, if it is fake, it is just insane the amount of detail they went through and the amount of effort that went to like plugging up potential holes in the story you know that's that's the thing uh the implications are enormous if this technology is real it renders the nuclear deterrence of non-us nations meaningless these objects can travel faster than any missile and create portals that can make any plane missile submarine or satellite disappear what makes this discovery so controversial is that this technology was allegedly used to make flight MH370 disappear. A tragedy that is surrounded by many conspiracy theories. How does a passenger plane vanish without a trace? Please watch this video, he says. So Ashton is here and he shares the videos which we can uh, play for our audience again or for those who haven't seen it. Uh, the one on the left is the drone footage the IR footage, and it's synced up with the satellite footage on the right here. Again, it's crazy just to look at this, just to see these orbs fly so quickly around this 777 and then making it vanish. So two different vantage points. And by the way, the one on the right is a screen record uh, of someone using a Citrix system, which means it's a, it is like a remote, um, not a remote view. Yeah, it's kind of like a remote view or a remote machine. So it's being played on another machine. Uh, see, and that's why he, there's a mouse right here showing, and he's just dragging it to have the correct view from the satellite. So there it is. And then we've seen this so many times. Huh? And then it just goes boom. Oh, wait, not yet. Oh, there it is. Gone. Yeah. So Ashton shared that so everyone can see it. What is um, interesting is now, where is he? You have Mick West. Yeah, Mick West comes in. And he goes, no, none of that. And he shares his video that says, debunks of the alien abducting a plane. Kim.com uh, replied back to him and says, hi, Mick. Saw your video. When overlaying the pyro effect with the portal, it doesn't match. It seems like someone searched an image database to find a close match, but it's not a perfect match. Ashton is doing a space in 30 minutes. Why don't you join and debate him? I'll be there. Um, and then Mick West goes, it seems more like someone used several frames. Anyway, he's not. I, I'm sure he did not join the space and he did not participate in this space right or debate i mean um here's a cool rendering of the orbs going around the the object a computer just just looking at it it's pretty mesmerizing again not saying it can't be faked but what we're saying is this is technology of probably a breakaway group breakaway civilization uh, using AI to control these orbs to make it in a pattern that or create a pattern that would make this technology work. You know, we don't know. Um, also, what showed up is Ashton was on a podcast, I guess. So, this is defending what happened on, on Reddit. This is important too. So, let's let's listen to this and uh, his point of view of what happened on Reddit when these videos resurfaced and investigators started investigating it again and just just what happened that background the story there uh let's listen to him so this investigation began on reddit it moved off of reddit and became mh370x part of the reason for that is that it actually this got, entire discussion got banned from that same ufos subreddit after about 
two weeks, I want to say. And the way that happened was very suspicious. A debunk got posted that claimed that they have found a shockwave VFX that was supposedly used in the portal effect. It was posted by a one-day-old account. It didn't have the karma to even be allowed to post on the subreddit. I talked to the moderators. They had... You know, that's important to mention. Yeah, on Reddit, for those who are not familiar, you need to have karma points. Karma points are made uh, to show that, you know, you didn't just create the account, that, you know, you're, uh, you are a legit account. Karma comes from people liking your replies or liking your posts, and that, you know, you've... you're. You have good faith in posting, and your at least your account was created in good faith, right? Um, so yeah, so that's why he's saying here that this account was just a day old, and then this subreddit allowed this account to post. That's usually not allowed in most subreddits, you know, to combat spam. Admitted that they gave it manual permission to do so. I asked them if they knew who the person was that was using this sock puppet to post. They would not respond and answer the question. The person who, uh, yeah, that's probably make quest or someone from MetaBunk contacted these guys saying, "Come on, we need to put our side in here. This is fake and blah, but it's important that we have different views," which is true, right? I'm not going to argue against that. Claims to have found these videos. There's only one person. Their name is Mick West, and they are on MetaBunk website. Yeah. On the same day that this was posted to the Reddit by the sock puppet account, Mick West made a post on the MetaBunk MetaBunk forum saying that he had found this VFX from an obscure video game in the '90s. Interestingly enough, this VFX does not match our VFX. Um, not only does it not match, it's the wrong color. So most explosions you would see in a video. <laughs> All right, I see what's going on here. So the one who posted this saying that that VFX does not match our VFX. That is interesting. Most explosions you would see in a video game are white, right? Mm -hmm. But what we see in our event is a dark thermal event. So not even the same thing. They ended up manipulating it to wait, try wait, to get wait, white, to right? Mm -hmm. But what we... Um, not only does it not match, it's the wrong edit by the Sock Puppet account. Mick West made a post on the Metabunk, Metabunk forum saying that he had found this VFX from an obscure video game in the 90s. Interestingly enough, this VFX does not match our VFX. This VFX is not a, does not match our VFX. Interesting. Could be just... You know, honest mistake. We all make him. You know, he's been on, been on a lot of podcasts. Probably tired. You know, I'll give him the benefit of the doubt. Still strange. Um, not only does it not match, it's the wrong color. So most explosions you would see in a video game are white, right? Mm -hmm. But what we see in our event is a dark thermal event. So not even the same thing. They ended up manipulating it to try to get one or two frames to match. And even then, they don't match. Uh, I tried to ask them, how many pixels match if you think that they look the same no one would answer that question interestingly enough they used this this uh debunk got upvoted to the top of the red, the subreddit on ufos and it was right. then used subsequently to shut down all conversation all of the comments within it and you can find this if you go search for it well that is weird if they used that one sock puppet account and that one allegation right that could that could be fake because of that and then use that to shut down the conversation is suspect that is so a lot of suspect things happening here right basically talk about how happy they are to have this debunked and how fine this is finally over it actually reminds me a lot of the nazca mummy debate that was going on in the last few weeks which i just can't understand why people who claim to be for disclosure would uh, be trying to tear other people down that hard so the discussion got completely banned from the subreddit. And at that point, a new subreddit was developed, Airliner Abduction 2014. And that's where the migrants from that were investigating went to. <clears throat> now, keep in mind, I had not been on Reddit at this time. I'm just following along, pulling the data off of it, doing my own investigation. And I went on Twitter and I started basically posting on Twitter. I made my persona, um, you know, used my real name. I began to, you know, put the facts out there. Uh, challenge uh, some of the disinformation that was out there. And all of this can be seen in my profile. So after that was banned, then everybody is on this airliner abduction subreddit. The problem with this subreddit is it's infiltrated and overrun with these Metabunk account people who 
who are out there trying to debunk every aspect of it, which I actually have nothing against as long as they're doing it in good faith. Sure. It turns out the debunkers actually proved more aspects of these videos than anyone else. To yeah, be true. true. Including Oops. the person I just mentioned, KCIMC, who proved that the flash accurately illuminates. Interesting enough, if you go find his post, he, he edited it at the top to say that he thinks it's fake, even though he proved that it's real. It's so that's or that aspect of it is real. Crazy, huh? Anyway, so I'm gonna include this in the notes. And he has a really Ashton, he Ashton Forbes has a really long document of um I guess evidence that you know a huge list of evidence is like, well, if someone debunked this, they would have to go through every single one of these like for example uh so he gives us the video archives satellite footage and then the thermal layer of the um, of the drone that was june 5th 2014 the satellite footage was march 12th 2014 so you're talking about like just, just a few days after the event uh requirements to understand the video to be authentic so 2017 dod Navy UAP video that shows drone flare. Uh, 2019 Trump satellite image, advanced theoretical physics concepts, AI, chat GPT, common use, video facts. I mean, he just goes through everything. I think we've we've covered this a lot on the show enough, you know. So you guys go check out the links that we have, and I guess um make your own decision, you know. Again, I'm not on the fence anymore. I'm more on, on the believing side that these things are real. Um, I wouldn't say it's impossible that, that it was hoax. I wouldn't. Not not these days. Um, but yeah, it would still be extremely difficult. But not shutting that down. So, here is a video just released. Uh, raw video designs unveiled for supersonic Designs unveiled for supersonic Star Wars plane that can travel up to 1150 miles per hour. So, a groundbreaking supersonic aircraft that promises to be the next generation of commercial travel could carry 300 passengers in ultra lux flights. Designed by Oxer Vanels of Barcelona, Spain, this spaceship like aircraft resembles something straight out of the Star Wars universe. So, for those who are watching, on YouTube, this craft is almost like a triangular craft. Yeah, it looks really cool. So, 300 passengers, it said, at 11.50 miles per hour. Yeah, it looks really nice. I mean, finally, we should have things like this. What took so long? Um, can I read more? Really cool. So uh, the design of this concept is a fusion of future commercial and military projects, incorporating innovative fuselage shapes, engines, and construction materials. Um, the name Hypersting is a nod to the aircraft's distinctive shape featuring a shape, uh, a sharp nose designed to control front airflow, redistributing it over the central part and wings. So yeah, cool seeing these stuff, planes like that come out or coming out. I mean, 300 passengers. Look at that thing. Yeah. I saw a press release of another company that released, that got funding, Supersonic. Very cool. 300 reminds me of what Reagan said that NASA has the ability to do. Um, so, yeah, so exclusive. The impossible, this is from the debrief. The impossible quantum drive that defies known laws of physics was just launched into space. So, a quantum drive. Uh, this was developed by Mike McCulloch. Well, at least the theory has. Um, so let's see here. 
Uh, Rogue Space Systems and IVO are working closely together to collect a solid baseline of orbital data before firing up the drives for the first time. This will help substantiate the thrust results of the quantum drives. Rogue Space, Space Systems has made positive contact with the satellite and LEOP has begun. We appreciate them lo- allowing us to, to uh, us to be a payload on their first satellite. And so far, it has ber- it has been working. Uh, is, it has been great working with them. So inventing the quantum drive. I think yeah, it is Mike McCulloch. How, there he is, Mike McCulloch at Plymouth University. Um, so the guys that launched this said, we began playing around with the idea of what is gravity and what is inertia. Then I came across the work of Professor Mike McCulloch. On his website, McCulloch notes that Newton's first law defines inertia with the observation that objects move in straight lines at constant speed unless pushed on. McCulloch further notes that although Newton defines inertia in these simple terms, the 17th century genius never quite explains what precisely inertia is. To explain the true nature of inertia, McCulloch developed his quantized inertia, QI, theory, which looks to the strange and mysterious properties of the quantum world for answers. Perhaps unsurprisingly, his Efforts to explain inertia have led to wide-ranging criticisms, of course, since its proposal seems to defy the laws of motion first set down so many centuries ago, laws that have proven highly reliable for rocket scientists and engineers alike. Still, Menzel says McCulloch's work intrigued him. Unlike others who believe the Plymouth University professor might be onto something, he was uniquely positioned to act on it. In fact, after receiving a patent for, cap- for a capacitor used in the wireless transmission of power, a primary market for IVO's commercial endeavor that includes the CBAT wireless transmission system, currently undergoing strict FCC safety testing for certification, Menzel realized that his facilities were well-equipped to do the initial prototyping of drives built, bu- uh, built using McCulloch's theories. Very cool. What if we start off by trying to replicate other people's work and see if there's any merit to QI, he told the debrief. Um, so, yeah, so they worked on it. Uh, they completed a, a stress test, which the quantum drive passed with flying colors. Um, well, let's see how it's doing in space. Electric drives tested in space. So they're talking about it. Whether or not the quantum drives produce the expected thrust IVO will have shown again that we are capable of not only trying hard experiments, we can do them efficiently in record time. All right, cool. It's cool. That he's testing these technologies, how science and technology can make anyway. So, um, so yeah, that's really cool. I, I, there's something else we're going to share in, the, in this episode about, he talked about DARPA and power and, and lasers that comes up this week too. Um, on a separate note, there was a guest on Jimmy Church's Fade to Black, Steve Steve Mara, um, and about C- CE5 products, uh, not products, but sessions, saying that uh, the CE5 could be the creation of the consciousness of the people in the CE5 event, as in like their... Um, them meditating on a specific subject or matter together then create a phenomenon and he's basing he's basing this on an experiment that happened in canada and i remember reading this i think in john keel's book at the end of it um where yeah where he talks about this experiment in canada where they can actually they created a ghost or an apparition by just giving him a name and a history and believing in him or it and then an apparition or a ghost was created by the people in the experiment. So, yeah, he mentions this, that CE5 could be that, too. Uh, makes sense also, right? Where now Bigelow is just focusing on consciousness. Valet always said it's about consciousness. So let's take a listen. Project Phenomena. And that was further into the skull experiments where phenomena can be conjured. Now... What's really interesting is that there was, an, there was a, an also an experiment called the Philip experiment. It took place in Canada and Ontario, 
which a number of, of, of psychologists and specialists, that literally created a ghost in a literal sense. It had actually its own physical existence. It was like a tulpa. Yeah. Um, and it was created, it was part of an experiment, and it was shown to be positive. These things, like, is, there's really no difference in having five people, five mediums sat around a, a sales. So just to read the slide he's talking about, the title is The, Con the Conjuring of the Phenomenon. The CE5 initiative and Philip and the Philip experiment. The Philip experiment was a 1972 parapsychological study conducted in Toronto, Ontario, to determine whether subjects can communicate with a fictionalized ghost. The scientific experiment was successful. Strange sounds, object movements, and even sightings of a ghostly manifestation matching the fictionalized drawings of the ghost was witnessed, proving that the power of thought can somehow manifest this phenomenon into the real physical world. The same methodology may apply to the conjuring of UFOs. The CE5 initiative consists of meditation training on location, be it a meditation group or a sitting of psychic mediums. It seems to be no different. This table uh, and having something materialize then there is five meditators out on the beach looking up at the sky trying to physically have something appear. It's the same thing as C5. It's like the C5 initiative and training is no different than the old German metaphysical society that became the Vril Society. It's exactly the same method if you're meditating on mediumship. So we always know that there's always been this method of being able to conjure phenomena. And it is the real phenomena, by the way, when you conjure it. It isn't, uh, oh, this is, uh, you know, it's, a, it's just something representing it. It is the real phenomena that you can conjure. And it gets into, you know, you, if you go back years ago or go back into the magic and conjuring of stuff and witchcraft and things like that. But it's all one of the same thing. We know that it can happen. Now, when we looked into these, doing these particular experiments, we realized very quickly, I mean, during Skull, the latter eight stages of Skull, I mean, Skull experiment had to get shut down because it was invaded by non-human entities. That was when they first appeared on the scene. Long before UFOs were talked about, it was were alien beings, interdimensional beings. Alistair Crowley came head to head with one, which referred to as Lamb. Yeah. In 19, it was 1908, and of course, exactly the same. And the photograph to the left is one which is the drawing from what Alistair Crowley said, 1919, his experience with this interdimensional. Do you know what, Jimmy? Steve is showing uh, Alistair Crowley, uh, for those of you that know, wrote a book because he met a being, I forget the name of the being now, but in 1919. So, and so Steve is comparing the image of that being with with an image of a being that showed up at a ce5 um meditation circle yeah there's definitely some similarities there and there's that cone head i'm convinced these, i mean these are plasma beings and even when there's when you talk about thought it's plasma you know it's the first time he ever got his book kicked uh, and that is the really bothered in this it that did he, bother, he, it bothered, he bothered him. him. Yes, it bothered him a lot. Yeah, he uh, didn't have control. He lost complete control. Right. This thing had him. You, you know, it came through. And um, what's interesting is the photograph to the in the middle is a, is a photograph taken only a number of years ago as part of the Stephen Greer um, meditation circle. You know, they sit around and they meditate about having experiences. And uh, and these things were photographed, just like in Skull, there were entities photographed and video filmed, and uh, the, and they had to close it down. They had to shut it down. The mediums lost control of the circle. Hmm. But the problem with that is, is that whatever these entities were, they stayed with the the main guy who the who was running the experiment in Skull, Robin Froy, who's unfortunately passed away now. They stayed with him for the rest of his life. They mm. invaded his life like the hitchhiker effect. And that's not good because sometimes this phenomenon does have a sting in its tail. Even Bob <laughs> Piccolo's. Maybe it's good me and Tover haven't done our CE5 event at the, 
<laughs> overlooking Laguna Beach, you know? Except now. You know. Although we always said, you know, to get rid of, there are cultures, and we've talked about this before, like in the Philippines, there are, there are cultures that know about this, the hitchhiker effect. So when this happens, you're supposed to go to a restaurant or something else and you shake them off there. You don't go straight home, you know, and that's probably the mistake that this guy made. You know, I can't believe due to some of the experiments, after I did these certain experiments at Skinwalker, that I had these multiple serendipities. So much bad stuff happened in my life. And it wasn't just him. There were more of the members of the NIDS that went through exactly the same thing. So sometimes I think you can press it too much. And it, it gets under your skin because it draws you in because you're interested. And that can be a problem sometimes because then it can start hitchhiking into your lives and cause all sorts of chaos sometimes. What I always found fascinating about Lamb, um, and I, I, I can't wait for your comment on this, is that that was in 1919. Most people don't. They, they, they Lamb, look at Lamb and it? they think that this was 1955. It wasn't. This was 1919. And Lamb was a personal experience with Aleister Crowley. This wasn't spread out through the media. This wasn't put in. News. Anyway, we'll leave the the clip in the in the notes, and you guys can check it out. But yeah, I mean, you know, of course, consciousness has is powerful enough to conjure things. You know, yes, I think that's what's hidden from us is is the power of the individual, and it's your power to conjure up things, right? That's why meditation is so important, especially if you're meditating on things that are positive, meditating on things that will help your life. It works. You will conjure up those things. You focus on them enough, and there's so much proof of that. Oh, yeah. So, so this is what I meant to share uh, right after the quantized inertia uh, news. So and this is apparently it's the same company. Uh, DARPA is developing laser technology to transfer power all over the world. This is not new technology. Tesla talked about it. Um, I've researched this be decades before about this too. Uh, it's microwave energy. I wanted to like uh, do something like that where, uh, but yeah, anyway. So it was it was the old Air Force commercials that claimed science fiction is what they do every day. Um, but the latest high technology to come from U.S. military research came from the Department of Defense or more specifically DARPA. Uh, DARPA, the U.S. Government Scientific and Technology Innovation. So power is not only the name of the game. So here we go. DARPA calls it the Persistent Optical Wireless Energy Relay or power. Uh, when it comes to transporting energy, they're talking about the wires here. So basically, they are transporting, distributing power using laser waves. And if we just go back to that debrief article, this um this company ivo they talk about it not the em drive no they talk about this technology that they have wireless transmission system cbat wireless transmission system so that's what we can see here pretty cool and it's good for our national security why if a nuke goes off and takes off our takes out our grid if we if we have these um then you don't have to worry about that because they can just be distributed wirelessly using optical means. All right, so this is from UAP James on X. I think this is uh, an IC intelligence community disinformation campaign against UFOs. As usual, these come up once in a while. So this guy, uh, let's... Let's take a listen to this clip from MSNBC. It's a new book on UFOs. Again, I think it's disinformation. Let's take a listen. It's rotating. All right, that was a video released by the Department of Defense that shows a Navy jet cruise encounter with a UAP, or Unidentified Aerial Phenomena, more commonly known as UFOs. The government has been releasing more videos like these as part of a new office working to detect these sightings and then share information with the public. Joining us now, New York Times best-selling author Garrett M. Graff. His new book is entitled <laughs> UFO, the inside story of the U.S. government's search he looks for like a alien spook. life Sorry. here and out 
there. It's good to have you back. Thanks so Congratulations much. Congratulations on the book. Yeah. Um, it's broken up into three. I don't know if this is a good way to start, but I want to understand yeah. what you've done here. Broken up into three parts: the space, the saucer age, the space age, and the interstellar age. What does that mean? What are you looking at? And is there life out there? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. 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 So the, the <laughs> math is on the side of the aliens, and that's one of the like biggest transformations in astronomy and science over the last. 20 years. Okay. Is in the 1990s, we did not know that there was a single other planet. Right. So we, we can blatantly lie to you before, but now we have to just say, oh, well, actually, there could be life out there. They're just not here. Uh, outside of our solar system. We now believe effectively every star in the universe has habitable, habitable planets. Okay. There are roughly, by the latest estimates, I'm sure many of us have known this. This is 1600s minimum. A sextillion habitable planets across the universe. That's a thousand what? trillion a habitable thousand tr trillion. A thousand trillion. Okay. So life could be rare, but it drip, drip, drip. Let's slowly give it to you guys. Do you really think that it's a one in sextillion chance? Huh? So this book tries to weave together sort of twin threads of the US military's hunt for UFOs here, which dates back to the sort of the early days of the Cold War, the, the dawn of the flying saucer age, 1947, Roswell sort of incidents that people are familiar with. And then the sort of evolving astronomy science mm -hmm. that shows that life is probably actually quite common out there across the universe. Garrett, we have. Yeah, see, so they're slowly introducing it. But now through science, it does help a lot of us out. <clears throat> Many of us were in denial, you know, or, yeah. A sectillion <laughs> questions. One in sectillion. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, uh, we could apply that to the your Jets chance. Uh, yes. Uh, in the last segment, uh, it does seem like there's been a really sharp increase in people thinking they've seen them. Now, some of that could probably be attributable to people having cameras, right? So you yep. uh -huh. But it also seems like the government is suddenly being way more forthcoming about these things. What do you make of that? Yeah, so that's actually what got me interested in this subject was uh, you, you now see sort of serious people talking seriously about this subject. Um, I, I sort of started this book in my mind, December 2020, John Brennan, someone you all know, gave this interview to Tyler Cowen, the economist journalist, yeah. where he says, basically, there's something flying around up there. We don't know what it is, and it puzzles me. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you know, John Brennan had just wrapped up the better part of a decade as a CIA director, White House Homeland Security advisor. There probably Good aren't crack. that many things yeah. that puzzle John Brennan. Yeah. Oh, man, this guy is such a... Uh, adversary is a, a mix. Intelligence community guy, for sure. Uh, anyway, so we got the link in there. Let's go to the ones who have been researching this and talk to like people like David Grush. And so Jake Paul, he's really into this subject. Uh, we've talked about him on this show also and shared some clips in the past. He had James Fox on who talked, who told him about that video. Uh, that someone had a video of a real flying saucer, I think somewhere in New Mexico, maybe. So he went right with cash and got an image or got a video of the of the footage anyway that's who jake paul is so he's really interested he obviously listened to the grush interview on mikhail's show jesse mikhail's show so jesse mikhail is is on jake paul's show and they're talking about that interview and different philosophical ideas of what this might be let's take a listen one of the thoughts is maybe on another universe they put more effort into these machines that can transcend time. But humans yeah. went down this rabbit hole of splitting the atom to it, make the, the bomb. Exactly. I love that you, you, you watch the whole that. Yeah, it's 100 percent. Yeah, the, like maybe there's an alt alternative timeline. Um, and this is a little part in the documentary that Grush says this. So I'm impressed you, you picked this up. That Grush was like, there is an possibly an alternative timeline where an alien civilization built civil propulsion and we went this more destructive route. And yeah, I mean, that's, that's possible. Like Jacques Vallée talks about that too. Right. Which is probably why they recognize uh, atomic energy, right. Or atomic signatures. Um, but we used it for destructive force while they used it for propulsion. It's not saying now we didn't use it for, propul for propulsion after that, 
and it went black, right? In the 1960s, there's lots of evidence that uh, this technology for nuclear propulsion went black in the 60s. It's coming back now, but we've had it for multiple decades. Uh, and it could be why these alien civilizations saw this signature and started to uh, to visit us. Like, oh, yes, yeah, someone else using that propulsion is going to join the space age or become a spacefaring nation or or join whatever it is you know uh so they start visiting when they saw us using nukes but we were using them for destruction uh for uh reasons maybe this is a gift where it's always like people always say why why did these things come from light years away just to crash if they can come from light years away they're so advanced why did they crash and Jacques Vallée thinks that maybe it's a gift. So maybe they're like gifting us the technology to build kind of better civil propulsion. But that means we have to have a government that we could trust to use it for our best interest. Right. And therein lies the problem because right now the government Pentagon is holding all these secrets yeah. in a big bag. Right. Let's just use it for war and let's just use Basket. it for war that we can win while no one else can win kind of thing, which is unfortunate. Uh, and that's when the government comes in and says, see, there's a lot of anti-government uh, sentiment around UFOs and UFO disclosure. Well, yeah, because, you know, we're blamed for polluting this planet, for using uh, energy products that are archaic and old and we have new ones. You know, we're blamed for that. And then we have to curtail our freedoms and we have to curtail what we eat and what we do because of that. So, yeah, the people who are in charge you know, do not have good faith into either increasing human freedom, uh, making life better on this planet. No, they want to perpetuate what is now in place and keeping them still in charge. Anyway, so I, I, after, you know, seeing that and other things, these came up. Um, these are alien encounters from the past. Um, so, writing in Ivan T. Sanderson's magazine Pursuit, 1991, American UFO investigator R. Perry Collins presents a group of very intriguing and controversial close encounter cases. So, observations of UFOs landing and normal-looking people leaving the craft to enter parked cars or cars lower from the UFO. The British Blue John case, which I didn't know anything about but apparently it's a it's a famous one of 1963 is one example though not mentioned by collins in this article he definitely has a point in his initial remark that there are aspects of the ufo situation that which are completely unrecognized by the public and generally ignored even among those people intrigued by the subject so one of the select examples of docu uh, documented by Collins was reported to him by a newspaper man on the Miami Herald staff. No date is given. Quote, in a time near Miami, Florida, the owner of a small supermarket was closing for the evening when he noticed a large, dark UFO hovering low over a field at the rear of his building. He immediately called the police, and within minutes, a cruiser arrived. Two officers stepped out, and the owner hurriedly took them to the rear door where all three men clearly saw the object hovering less than 50 feet over a nearby field. As they watched, the object began lowering two large cylinders to the ground below. Both cylinders landed and began splitting open and dissolving at the same time. One continued a, one continued a large sedan. The other contained several men dressed in business suits carrying briefcases. Within minutes, the two cylinders had completely disappeared and the UFO had moved off into the evening sky. The men got into the sedan and drove off the field into a nearby road and away. The next case is from Puerto Rico. Ufologist Jorge Martin's book, Evidencia OVNI. The observation occurred in the afternoon, March 1992 at El Cayul Sierra Bermeja, Puerto Rico. A man out testing a new video camera in an isolated wooded area suddenly caught sight of a flash of light overhead. He hid behind some bushes as he saw a small silvery disc-shaped object land in a clearing on three leg-like supports. 
A section of the object resembling an elevator was lowered to the ground to the ground and a door opened. Two short two short four foot tall beings then emerged from inside the object. The beings had uh, gray skin and had large heads and large black eyes. They wore gray colored one piece suits. They looked around for a few moments and re-entered the object only to emerge a few minutes later, this time accompanied by a tall human, very pale and thin. He had short platinum blonde hair and wore a pair of dark sunglasses. He also wore a new black suit and pants with a white shirt and a red tie. The t- red tie. The tall human looked around and walked towards a nearby path. There he was met by two soldiers soldiers in mil- in a military jeep. He sat in the jeep and it drove away, disappearing into the woods. The two short humanoids then entered the disc-shaped object, which then shot away into the sky at high speed. Strange, huh? Really strange. So it um it linked so that article linked to the Blue John case, which it said it's well known. I've never heard of this Blue John case, but apparently Timothy Good is the one uh behind this Blue John case. Timothy Good, for those who not who don't know, is a very well known author uh, and investigator in the UFO field. So just to talk about that, in a, in a letter to Timothy Good in 1984, I asked why he regarded her, this is Joel, or Joel, uh, about the, she's she's the witness about the, um, about that case, the Blue John, the Blue John case. So she, someone asked him, why is she reliable? And he goes, why reliable? This is Timothy Good. I've known known her since 1952 and can vouch for her integrity. Uh oh, someone sorry, not Timothy Good knew her, but the person who wrote the the letter. She has never tried to capitalize on the story and indeed is unable to discuss all the details due partly uh to the ET's ability to control her memory of certain things they told her, and also because she was in the Maquis French resistance in the last war, and thus is able to keep some information to herself. So the witness in this contact story died in 1995 and subsequently Timothy Good could publish all the details in his 1998 book Alien Base. Although he didn't reveal the full name of the witness only calling her Joelle because she was reluctant even to have the story published after her death but already in 1989 I was informed of her full name Mrs. Joel Marchmont, Marmont, no, anyway, by ufologist Norman Oliver, who had also been involved in the case. So let's get into the case. Um, so here's the summary. Joel was born in St. Petersburg, Russia in 1914. After the war, she worked in Paris and later moved together with her husband and two daughters, Frederic and Isabel, to London. In September 1963, Joel was in the Sheffield area conducting a house-to-house field survey for a market research company. In one of the houses Joel visited, she noticed an unusually large amount of modern-looking gadgets. This is in 1963, including a large radio transceiver. The lady, the lady in the house, Rosemond, explained that her husband was a scientist and radio amateur. When Rosamond pro- uh, briefly left the room, Joel heard a message in English from the radio. Quote, we'll be at Blue John tomorrow, 4.30 p.m. Mark. She wrote down the message, but when Rosamond came back, she was only informed that message had come through. This obviously shocked Rosamond because of her background in the French resistance during the war. Joel suspected she had uncovered an international spy ring. So on Monday, September 16th, she went by car to this area and parked at a vantage spot overlooking the valley and waited. At 4.30 p.m., Joel noticed a brilliant light in the sky, which came to rest several hundred yards from her position. The glow ceased and a disc-shaped aircraft appeared instead, landing on tripod landing legs. 
a me a man in a one piece suit stepped out of the craft and simultaneously a man appeared coming from a car parked nearby. Joel recognized the car as one as the one that had been parked outside Rosemond's house. The two men greeted each other warmly and walked towards the car, which drove away. The craft began to glow, lift off from the ground, shooting off at a fantastic speed. Now, at the time, Joel did not accept the existence of flying saucers and believed the craft to be some sort of secret Russian craft. She decided to go back to Rosemond's house to find out more and then perhaps report the incidents to the police. When she knocked at the door, the scientist's husband in the story named Jack opened the door but was reluctant to let Joel in. At that point, Mark, now in terrestrial clothes, interjected, that's all right, let her in. Joel tried to present a cover story that she needed some answers for her field survey. Mark understood that this was a lie and said, why don't you tell us the real reason why you are here? You came here because you saw my craft and wanted to find out what was going on. Joel was let in on the truth and spent a large part of the night talking with the visitor. So she gradually accepted that Mark was indeed a man from another planet. For the next 15 months, Joel had several meetings with Mark and another visitor, Val. Two times they met in Joel's flat in London. These men, these men claimed they were secretly working together with a team of scientists from several nations. At one occasion, Joel was invited to inspect one of, one of their craft that had landed close to the Welsh border. She helped the visitors in a number of ways. Val and Mark were extremely refined, fair-skinned, with perfect teeth, very kind, perfect teeth, <laughs> and perfect gentlemen with lots of humor. So in 1967, three years after the last meeting with Mark and Val, Joel claimed to have been visited by two men from home office in London. They wanted to know about the disappearance of Jack and Rosamond and some other scientists. The men were aware of the count contact story, but Joelle refused to answer some of their questions. Neither did she tell all she knew to Timothy Good. One of the things mentioned by Mark and Val was that their group would intervene in the event of a nuclear catastrophe if it threatened to destroy our planet. She was also informed that we are spiritual beings surviving death. The experiences with Mark and Val remained a treasured and vivid memory for Joelle all her life. Really cool, huh? Really cool. And we will also put in uh, the show notes the full text from Timothy Good's book about the encounter and what he knew uh, about Joel. Very, very cool. It always, again, it, always, it goes back to the nuclear aspect of everything, right? And that they will intervene and protect this planet, this gem of a planet we have, if it's if nu nuclear holocaust happens. Um, and of course, you know, because that's from the 60s and 50s, this came up, which is the Flatwoods Monster. I, we're not going to play his entire clip here, but the Flat, Flatwoods Monster uh, is linked to another event, also nuclear, where apparently these UFOs, three large ones, were coming down. Was it Oak Ridge National Labs? One of our national laboratories that have nukes. And then when the military saw them coming in, we shot at them. One of them actually got hit, and that is behind the Flatwoods Monster. It crashed in West Virginia. This being apparently came out and was seen in New York. Um, many witnesses saw this creature that they're called the Flatwoods Monster. So this is the original report that we're putting in our uh, in the show notes. Well, here, this Stan let's hear Stanton Friedman talk about it. Right here. All those things, you, you've got a very important context for the story. And that's what had been there. It was the highest place in the area. So whoever was running the darn thing would look around and say, hey, we'd better put it down there. There's no place else. We're in bad trouble otherwise. So that made sense. That place made absolute sense. And then when you go up the hill to go past the tree, what's left of it, the family the people had gone up past and the monster came out from then you could again understand they're going up there to see what's up there they have no expectation at all of running into something over here especially some it's a monster some different things totally unexpected thing 
And so when you start looking at this and you talk to the witnesses and you find out that the kids got sick, got a whiff of this crazy gas or oil or whatever it was, maybe the two together, uh, and how they understood it could make kids sick. And the kids were sick all night long. The reporter found that out. When you hear about what uh, the National Guard guy, uh, Dale Levitt, found, it begins to really pile up facts and data and information. And then when I read the Air Force explanation, gee, no surprise there, it was just a meteor. Well, meteors have certain properties. They move very rapidly. When they hit the ground, there's a big noise and usually a big hole in the ground, and there are remnants of the meteor. None of these hold true. Meteors don't circle around the city. <laughs> anyway, it's a fascinating case. And the reason why I went through all these different cases from the 50s and the 60s it's because that new author coming out saying that, that actually, sorry, um, the U.S. government is actually ignorant about what UFOs are. That's BS. They completely know what it is. The intelligence community knows what it is. The military knows what it is. Who are they? You know, the different theories behind them. So that new book is just intelligence community disinformation. Here's a great clip. Dr. Jacobs, he's well known here on the right. He's the one that came out um, when he was in the military. His job was to take videos of mil of missile tests. And for those of you that remember, he disclosed um, a story where he was part of a project where we had a new missile that was being tested, uh, nuclear tipped, but I think it was a mock mock nuke or something and he filmed this event but then when they viewed it later they saw a ufo come in and shoot lasers onto the warhead and knocked it out when it was in space so he tells that story so he's being interviewed here and it's really funny he talks about arrow and kirkpatrick and uh what's going on there with the military and disclosure let's take a listen what happened to that film what have you yeah, see, so his film was taken by the CIA. So uh, he's asked here by the Gr Good Trouble show, what happened to that film that you filmed? What happened to that film? What have you heard about where it went and, and possibly where it is today? Okay. Major Mansman told me face-to-face -face that the CIA guys took the real film, spooled it off till they got the part about the UFO off, cut it off, gave him back the real film and said, you are never to talk about this again. And he said that film went back to someplace back east. Our supposition was it probably went to CIA headquarters. I don't know where it went. But for years and years, I thought, well, they probably threw it away. They burned it. And then a good friend, Lou Elizondo, told me, I was out in Los Angeles uh, earlier this year, taking part in a documentary film and I had just recounted my testimony. It's not a story, it's testimony about this. And Lou shouted from the room. He said, I saw that film. Hmm. And I shouted, what film? He said, your film. I saw it. So, as you know, Lou had been with ATIP. And obviously, the film still existed somewhere. He saw it. Uh, I believe Dave Grush said that uh, that he believed Dave had saw uh, that Lou had seen it. And so it's back there somewhere. Uh, I said, I, I, I don't know. With Kirkpatrick at the helm of Aero, I don't know where it's gone. It's possible <laughs> it has been annihilated, but it's oh been, yeah, probably gone you know, forever. So, yeah. Dave, Dave Grush told me he's going back to DC sometime in the next week or so. And I said, uh, Dave, please do something for me. Tell Doctor Kirkpatrick that Doctor Jacob says, "Fuck you." <laughs> <laughs> I think a yes, lot of I people want to tell tell Kirkpatrick fuck you. So sorry. I do uh, have that's why he's leaving. So I, I am actually Dr. Jacobs. <laughs> All right. Well, hey, Dr. Jacobs uh, or uh, Dr. Kirkpatrick, your fellow Dr. Jacobs says fuck you. All right. I mean, take, that, that... take me on, Sean. Take me on, Sean. Come and get me. Come I... on. <laughs> you come oh man it's too bad you know and and i bet you anything the guy who's going to, or the person that's uh that's going to replace kirkpatrick is going to be much worse they usually are it never gets any better um so yeah that's right this happened 
Uh, exclusive photo captures UFO intercepted by UK's Royal Air Force. As Five Eyes Intelligence report highlights growing difficulty in monitoring surge of unidentified craft across the Middle East. Wow, that's a long uh, title there, guys. Liberation Times. So this is that image. Hmm. Yeah, not very clear, is it? Never is when they release this stuff. So that's Jeremy Corbell and George Knapp. They announced this on their show that this is what they got. It was an RAAF, Royal Air Force, British right Air Force, that supposedly shot down. They called it a drone and destroyed it, but they couldn't find any of the wreckage. So in 2021, the UK's Royal Air Force intercepted an object initially flagged as a potential terrorist drone above Syria. However, a Five Eyes intelligence report generated months following the event classified the object as a UFO or a UAP. This new revelation was reported by investigative journalists Jeremy Corbell and George Knapp on their podcast, Weaponized. Unfortunately, that image is just so not clear everyone just made fun of it which sucks you know so but you know this wouldn't have happened if it's nothing the alleged drone was classified as uap within a five eyes intelligence report so there it is it was like a mushroom cloud um but apparently it was shot down and they couldn't find the wreckage at all so here's a really cool clip it's about 12 minutes so I'm probably going to maybe put this on quickly, but it's important. Um, this is about the Calvine UFO. And the Calvine UFO is that diamond UFO that was, that, was, that was taking a picture in Scotland or somewhere in the UK. And the UK Ministry of Defense had that image of it saying it's, it's the best clear image of a UFO we have. So apparently... This is not debunking it, but it has a um, an explanation for what it could be. So let's take a listen. I don't want to spend the whole 12 minutes. I might skip here and there. I might make it quick. Hey, people. I really didn't think I'd be returning Oh, just to say this, this information came from or who who alerted this to this information was alien scientists. Go follow him on on YouTube and on Twitter. You'd find him there. He's been in this for a really long time, people. So definitely follow him for um, information about the UFO disclosure news and the technology and the real science behind these. This guy, the Calvine UFO. But I am. For some very complimentary reason, people contact me and tell me stuff. Just last week, I got an email that said, Glenn Sander. Excellent information. And just this weekend, an anonymous person, a viewer, I guess, emailed me two words again, an acronym, V-L-T-A-S and Calvin. Sorry, V-L-T-A-S. I mean, who's sending them this stuff? You know, obviously it's like Intel or, all right, yeah, whatever. I don't have a clue, really. So I looked it up. VLTAS, vacuum lighter than air structures. You vacuum lighter than air structures. It is really cool and could be a possible uh, explanation for what the Calvine UFO is. Using aerogel. Uh -huh. Aha! Okay, stop. <laughs> Dr. David Clark's team and me have both been investigating from evidence what people tell us into what the Calvine UFO photograph, this one, might actually be. David Clark's team is doing brilliant work looking for the photographer, still hasn't turned up and looking at the whole story of the daily record and the non-publication. But the team found or was contacted by somebody who had an idea what the device actually was, a military weapon. And from what he told them, the diamond device was a Gulf War, the invasion of Iraq, laser targeting drone, and the Harriers were US Air Force. 
um, I got different information. I was contacted by an anonymous person who works for BAE Systems. That, of course, used to be British Aerospace at the time of the Calvin picture was taken. But what he told me was everybody in the canteen round the water cooler at Wharton, BAE Systems, found the whole Calvine thing incredibly amusing because they know what it was. It's, according to him, a radar targeting device faceted. And the two Harriers... All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fast forward here. All right, so wait. Oh, wait, this is important. Wait, wait, wait. So he's saying this is not a new... There's been patents about this. So here, one second. Here we go. For some science and talk about buoyancy. So we've often heard of balloons or deriggable airships being called lighter than air craft. Mm -hmm. That's because if you could have a gas inside, such as hydrogen and helium, which is lighter than our atmosphere, the atmosphere makes it buoyant. The upward buoyancy. Actually, you need to know what buoyancy is. So air or liquid gets more dense as it goes near the bottom. So the air pressure at sea level is denser than the air pressure up in the stratosphere. And that difference is buoyancy. So the air beneath an object is more dense and actually it's right. holding it up. And the air above it is less dense and producing effectively lift. So if the object is lighter than it's pulled by gravity towards the earth, it will rise, it will become buoyant. And the easiest way to do that is to fill an envelope, a balloon with hydrogen or helium, which is less dense than air. But there's a better way. And it's not a new idea. It probably goes right back to Leonardo da Vinci. A number of people have tried this, but it didn't work. So what's less dense than air? Hydrogen, helium, and no air. Yeah, a vacuum. No air. Imagine you have a balloon and you suck all the air out of it. What's inside it is less dense than the air on the outside. And it will be buoyant. But it won't work, will it? Because the air pressure will crush the balloon flat like a pancake. And that was the problem. If you could encase a vacuum in a skin that would stop it collapsing under air pressure and stopping air rushing in, you could make a vacuum balloon. And there's mm. various patents going way back for vacuum balloons. But guess what? They don't work. The only way to do it would be to have a metal balloon, something to actually encase the vacuum, the evacuated chamber, which would be lighter than air, but mm. the weight of the metal would be so heavy it wouldn't float. And that was why it never worked. To make it work, you'd have to have some material to contain a vacuum that's lighter than the weight of the material. Well, oh, let's go to Los Alamos Laboratory and look at this stuff. This stuff. This stuff. Ugh. I don't have any. Aerogel. Aerogel is actually quite old. It's a way of extracting all the liquid out of a matrix of a jelly. So if you've got jello, boing 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 and sucked all the water out of it but kept the structure of the uh pig bones <laughs> you'd have this hollow solid form the shape of the jello but with no liquid in it oh you can do that but it's incredibly fragile <laughs> it has no structure so along came who am i gonna say Edward Teller. Oh, Edward Teller, one of my favorite demons of course. who invented the hydrogen bomb. The hydrogen bomb needs to have tritium gas and other things inside it. It's two bombs. It's an atom bomb and it's a hydrogen bomb with a secondary explosion. And that's all controlled with a foam or a gel. Early hydrogen bombs actually used expanded polystyrene. That's why expanded polystyrene was invented. But more sophisticated hydrogen bombs use something called aerogel, developed by the Los Alamos National Laboratory in New Mexico. But spool forwards to a few years before the Second Gulf War. And that's the key point. 
the Los Alamos Laboratory invented an aerogel that can contain a vacuum. Oh, they invented VLTAS, vacuum lighter than air structures, very secretly. So how does an aerogel vacuum structure work and how does it make a flying object? Good question. I love answering these things for you. So you've got now a structurally strong type of aerogel that doesn't collapse under air pressure. Over it, you put a very thin skin. It could just be cloth. It could just be mylar. It could be anything that you want. All you have to do is stop the air rushing in to fill the vacuum. It's not actually encasing the vacuum. The vacuum is now evacuated air in the structural aerogel. Here mm. is the US patent for it. So it really does exist. And look at this in the patent. What's their preferred a tic -tac. for a vacuum lighter than air vehicle? A tic tac. Uh, I don't think it's related. I don't really think the tic tac is a balloon. Honestly, it's not a balloon. But maybe <laughs> a vacuum balloon structure actually explains what the weird potato they saw over the hillsides of Persia. Because nobody knows what the object actually is. We might know what it was used for, a radar reflector for laser weapon guidance, very practical, or a British Aerospace Stealth Skin Metamaterial Test Vehicle, also likely, and possibly both. I think this is very interesting, because what did the witnesses really see? Well, we assume that they saw the object hover above the ground, and then there's written reports of it shooting up, Oof and disappearing at a fast speed. Those are two things that this advanced secret aerogel vacuum device can actually do. It's not manned. Inside is a gel and a vacuum pump. If you balance the amount of vacuum and the amount of atmosphere inside it, it becomes neutrally buoyant yeah. at any height you want ideal for a laser targeting or a radar cross-section device yeah so that's another excuse or another explanation for what the calvin uh ufo is we shared also another patent uh that shows a similar shaped object electro using electrogravitics to make it lighter than air so you know who knows who knows now, on that subject of high technology, right, and free energy, we're back to the thunderstorm generator. And proof is from Alchemical Science on YouTube. And proof um, of plasmoids in the generator exploding. Let's listen to this. Really cool. Bob's recent analysis of the macro photography of the inside of the outer sphere and the outside of the inner sphere from the retrofit uh, provide us with some startlingly clear evidence that plasmoid or ball lining phenomena is occurring within the thunderstorm generator unit. And what he is seeing correlates with the results of a host of previous significant experiments performed by scientists studying plasmoids in physics historically. Essentially, Malcolm is 100% correct in his initial claim, or that's what these results indicate. There are plasmoids in the system that are doing the majority of the work, and the structures are highly suggestive of this phenomena, to say the least, can clearly be seen in Bob's analysis of this sample. The thunderstorm generator is producing plasmoids on a large scale. And what's more, they're embedding themselves in the metal of the spheres of the units, or again, this is what this indicates. I've received confirmation from a handful of people now that once the units have been conditioned for some time, uh, such as this eight-year-old original prototype, then the thunderstorm generator retrofit and even the engine can become embedded with plasmoids and continue to operate with significantly reduced carbon reductions, even after the bubbler has been completely disconnected or the valve turned off. Yeah, I'd like to mention that we had a, a listener comment on one of our videos um that it's not it's not going to replace carbon or fossil fuels but only but greatly reduce their effects you know and, and we've seen these tests where they still need oil or gas to start um 
the engine. But then once the bubble comes in, the thunderstorm generator comes in, um, it doesn't need it anymore. It just needs to get started. So it greatly reduces, I think, like, what, 98%, 99%, something like that. Um, so it doesn't negate it. We still need it. But then, you know, it's these plasmoids are generating the energy after them. You can see it's just, and they said, the theory says that millions of these explosions are happening, which is creating the energy from the thunderstorm generator instead of fossil fuels. The plasmoids are causing a permanent change in the metal spheres over time, uh, and they appear to be embedding themselves within the structure, again, as Malcolm's original claims. Anyway, let's delve into Bob's analysis and cover the key points from his initial groundbreaking findings. What we're going to be looking at is these two parts of the thunderstorm generator, the nested spheres. The spheres are being analyzed here are the large pair from the Perkins gas generator in the UK. That's what they're being used recently for. Um, they were actually manufactured eight years ago by Malcolm and the team working on a previous prototype. Um, and they've been run on several large generators for some hundreds of hours. So that's their history. The analysis was done on the outside of the inner sphere and the inside of the outer sphere. So, you know, they're facing into that same cavity. We see these pockmark or leopard print like patterns. Uh, and this is the most significant observation here. Um, however, it's also curious that we can see many crystals and these other structures forming. And Bob touches on the likelihood of what these structures could be. And I'll show a couple here a bit later uh, for an example. But he plans to perform further analysis under the SEM uh, to provide us with the facts. So I'll hold off on going too much into the elemental composition of. Yeah, very co cool to see proof of these plasmoids actually taking place within the th thunderstorm generators. Um, we'll leave a link in the description and in the show notes just so you guys can do a deep dive and man i would really love to build a thunderstorm generator uh we shared last week or was it two weeks before uh with full schematics of how to do it so if, if you're a welder or have those type of skills man do it i mean and if you have a generator you, you all you need is probably a tank of fuel will last you years and you'll have electricity i mean you know i'm serious that should be a goal of mine next year, 2024, is to build one of these things and to have it just just ready. Who knows for you know why you know we'd need it. Uh, and again, no digital moving parts in those generators, so perfect for preppers. If we have you know a nuclear war or EMP or it wouldn't ruin that thunderstorm generator. It's all analog. All right, so are we alone? If is from the Tennessean. If extraterrestrials are out there, $200 million gift should help SETI. Now, my opinion about SETI is, is a waste of money. This is what, what SETI does. It looks at the radio spectrum, but looks at a specific little tiny slither, sliver, sliver of the radio spectrum. Something whether about hydrogen and hydrogen. And if a species knew hydrogen's numbers, they would only communicate through here so yeah the radio spectrum is huge people seti is just looking at a little tiny one and across galaxies and it's impossible and i think that's the point they'll never find intelligent life uh with their method and that's why they do it so here's 200 million dollars from uh it's a philanthropic philanthropic gift the gift came from the estate of the late tech entrepreneur Franklin Antonio, co-founder of communication chip company Qualcomm. Yeah, so he knows something. But why would he want to perpetuate the disinformation and us never finding any other evidence? Very strange. Someone who founded Qualcomm is close to the military industrial complex, close to you know, being gifted technology from reverse engineering. So I guess it would make sense then, you know, if his legacy or his family would remain rich and powerful, then yeah, perpetuate that. That's not out there. That's just my opinion. All right. So, oh, here we go. So we're ending. Um, oh, yeah. It's been an hour and 20 minutes. So here's a funny thing happening in Congress. 
for those who have not seen it, this is Senator Mullen. Take a listen. This is really funny. Like he's self-made. Sir, I wish he was in the truck with me when I was building my plumbing company myself. And my wife was running the office because I sure remember working pretty hard and long hours. Pretends like he's self-made. What a clown. Fraud. Always has been. Always will be. Quit the tough guy act and these Senate hearings. You know where to find me. Any place, any time, cowboy. Sir, this is a time, this is a place. If you want to run your mouth, we can be two consenting adults. We can finish it here. Okay, that's fine. Perfect. You want to do it now? I'd love to do it right now. Well, stand your butt up then. You stand your butt up. Oh, hold on. Big oh, hold, stop it. Is that your Sorry. solution? Every call. <laughs> no, no, sit down. Sit down. Okay. You know, you're okay. a United States senator. Sit down. Active. Oh, okay. Yo, you're not in Senate. Sit down, please. All right. Let's Can I respond? Mr. Hold Chairman. it. Hold it. If Hold we can't, no, I have the mic. Said. I'm sorry. This is Hold what it. he said. You'll have your time. Okay. Can I respond? Oh, no, you can't. <laughs> this is a hearing. <laughs> really funny. Um, all right. So we'll leave you with this. This is so they tested all these different cars. They put a cement between a cement wall and a Mack truck. And they tested all these different vehicles. Wait, wait a minute. Sorry. Here it is. Yeah, they tested all these different vehicles. So let's let's watch this. We'll leave you with this and then we'll end the show. Uh and you'll know what vehicle to buy just in case this happens. Ford Bronco, 0%. Lamborghini Urus, survival rate, 45%. Porsche Cayenne, survival rate, 0.1%. Ford Explorer, survival rate, 99.9%. Audi Q7, 98%. Volkswagen Touareg, 24%. Rover, 7%. Lexus LX, 1% survival rate. BMW X7, 0%. Chevrolet Tahoe, whoa, 50%. Honda Creta, 75%. Not bad. Hyundai. Oh, that's repeating now. So it shows you. So get a Ford Bronco and or a Ford. Uh, no, wait. Or is that the Lamborghini? Anyway. Well, uh, thanks, everyone. Really mixed to Miss Topher. Wish she was here to react to the different stories that we have this week. Uh, but, you know, he's out. Let's wish him all the best. Let him enjoy his time. Um, follow us on Twitter at UAP the podcast. We're on Rumble at uap podcast we're on uh youtube at uncovering anomalies podcast and we're on all the different and major podcasting platforms our support link is always at the end of each uh description um mostly everywhere or at least on the on the podcast platforms other than that leave, leave us your feedback let us know how we're doing and um this has been episode 46. I am your host, Adam, and we'll see you all next week.